It's just sharing with the pastor. There we are. Good morning, Dolly. I am now officially on. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful day. Beautiful day out there today. Folks, if you would take your bulletins and then look at the welcome and announcements that are there for us, as it says, happy Father's Day. Next week, and I always say this, folks, in our bulletins next week, there are things that pertain to you in this bulletin, things that are important, things for us to consider, things for us to immerse our hearts and minds in as we consider the Lord, not just on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening, but as believers in the Lord's word all the time. Fifteen minutes in the word at noon, Bible and prayer study next Wednesday, ladies' Bible study Friday morning. These are important events in our lives as Christians and members here at Salem Baptist Church. And there's not one of us that doesn't like somebody, someone, somewhere, somehow praying for us. And this is what our prayer focus is for, to take it home to remember people, and there's folks with health problems. And it's so pleasant to me when I come in here and then I hear somebody come up to me and say, I've been praying for you in your situation. What a comfort that is. What a joy. So we have folks with prayer problems, and they're called loved ones. Whether you consider them loved ones or not, they really are. They're our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we are supposed to be the family of God, right? Pray for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and their concerns and their ailments. Our family and friends at the Drew and things that are going on. And then we have fellow churches that have needs. Take the time to bring them up. Like, we appreciate our pastor. But there's some facilities, some churches that don't have pastors. And they're dearly looking for someone somehow to come in and, and share the gospel with them and continue to encourage them. So we have family and friends at the Drew, people who aren't well. Uh, pastors uh, dealing with COVID. That's still a big issue. I noticed uh, Gail and I were away on a big 911 ride this weekend. And uh, surprised at the number of people who are putting the masks back on. And uh, one of the ladies that we met, Laura, just a little English girl from England, and uh, she got a job here in Canada with EHS, and, and she didn't know how to greet people. She had the mask on, and I just walked in Saturday night at Keddie's down there in Truro, and she saw her sitting all by herself, and there was only four chairs left, so there was Gail and I and another couple of CMA members. We walked over, sat down, and boom, we were into conversations and things. She said, I, I didn't know what to do. The rest of the weekend, she had it off. I'm not that I had an influence in that, but just people are now becoming concerned again. Unsaved people. Everybody in your families are saved, right? Now, I have two brothers that aren't interested in the Lord at all at this point. But I speak to them, and I pray about them. Our church finances, and even our own personal finances, these are challenging times today. Teen Challenge, Ukraine. And then we have a couple that haven't been to our worship gatherings for quite a while. And here, here's an opportunity for each and every one of us to send an email, a telephone call, a card to Dale and Carolyn and say, we miss you, we love you. That's a big word to use today. And invite them back here and that they may feel God's comfort and presence, but also know that we're holding them up in prayer as well. We have a couple of birthdays there to look at as well. But folks, let's take the opportunity to recognize whose world this is right now. Please stand with me as we sing hymn number 143, This Is My Father's World. Thank you. 
thank you. Please be seated. Boy, I just had a wonderful treat. Right now, I saw my good friend Linda singing. You sing with a laugh on your face. All I don't know how you do that. God bless you, dear. It's just great to see that joyful look on your face again. We have another hymn, hymn number 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I just have my message for Regina, Saskatchewan. Pastor? Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there and granddads. And it's a good day to be here to celebrate our fathers and our heavenly fathers. As Malcolm said, we have much to pray about, so let's go to the throne of grace, shall we? Father in heaven, again, we just thank you for who you are. And Lord, we thank you that we could come before your throne of grace this morning. Um, you tell us in your word that we can come with boldness, with confidence. Um, we don't have to come 
uh, in a fearful manner, uh, but we come because we know that you are our Father and you want to hear from us. So this morning we come just thanking you for who you are. And Lord, as we have been looking in our Wednesday nights at the attributes of God, and we pretty well finish each lesson with how should we apply this? We should apply these things by thanking God for them. So we thank you that you are a God of love. We thank you that you are a God of forgiveness and a God of grace and a God of mercy. We also thank you that you are a holy God and you are a just God. And as we looked last week, we thank you that you are a good God. We sing that chorus, God is so good. And we sing it because that is so true. Um, you have been good to us. You allowed us to be here this morning. Um, you woke us up this morning. You put food in our stomach, clothes on our back. You gave us a place where we could come and freely worship you together. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness towards us. And this is just the beginning of the day. You have more blessings in store for us, I'm sure. Lord, I thank you for our fathers, for our dads, for our granddads, um, for those who are spiritual dads. Um, we are here today to, to celebrate them and to celebrate you. And this morning we will look at the example of a perfect father and how we can take some of those examples and apply them to our own lives as fathers. Uh, we thank you for all of our fathers. We thank you for our biological fathers. We thank you for those who have made the choice to be adoptive fathers and stepfathers and Lord um, grandfathers. And again, as I said, spiritual fathers. So we thank you for each one of these men that are here, um, those that are online and those that couldn't be with us. Uh, we just ask a special blessing on them um, this morning, Father. And we do come before you. Um, we have our prayer focus, Lord, and there's many people on this list. Um, Lord, we praise you that uh, Louis is, is home doing better and is out walking around and such, so continue to touch his body, Father. Um, we praise you that my dad is feeling good and is recovering from his surgery as well. Um, Lord, we just thank you. And he had a doctor's appointment the other day, and we were just amazing how good you are. Um, as of right now, he doesn't even have to take insulin anymore. Um, so we thank you for that, Father. And um, so many other praise items of people who were sick and recovered, people who had surgeries and are recovering. Um, we just bring them before your throne of grace again this morning. And Lord, we continue to pray for Glenn, um, continue to, to, to watch over him and put your hand on him, Father. Uh, we pray for his wife as well. And Lord, we also think of Colin as he's waiting for surgery still on his knee. Um, Lord, we just pray that the doctors would see how serious this is, how it's hindering him from doing what he needs to do and what he enjoys doing. Um, so just be with them and may they be able to pick a date quickly um, so he can have this done. And Lord, we also think of, of uh, Judy's friend, Linda. Lord, we just pray that you would give the doctors wisdom on how they can proceed with her um, we just pray that all this drainage issue and everything would be settled and that she could move on from this father. Um, we continue to pray for our brother Jim and his eye, Lord. Uh, we just pray that this appointment would be, would be sooner than later so that they could do what needs to be done. We pray for our brother Malcolm as well as he will get results from some of the tests that he had um, this coming week, Father. Um, we just pray that, that they'll be able to figure out what's going on with him as well. Um, so, Father, we've just put all of these folks that are on our page, those that were mentioned, those that weren't mentioned, we just bring them before your throne of grace. And, Lord, we know that you will answer in a way which is best for each one and in a way that will bring you honor and glory. Uh, we do think of our, our friends and family at the Drew. Um, Lord, it was so nice getting back in to visit with them again. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would encourage them that you would keep them strong and healthy, Father, um, that there'd be no more illnesses going through our nursing homes here in our area, Father. Um, so just protect these dear folks. And Lord, uh, watch over those that, that visit, watch over those that look after them. We are so thankful for the care that is given to all of our seniors, Lord. So we just, again, just 
thank you and praise you for allowing us to be here. We thank you that we have your word in our hand that we can open freely and read and study. So we just ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us in everything this morning and you would receive the honor and the glory for this is what we ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to our scripture reading this morning as we continue through the book of Revelation and we are going to read Revelation chapter 17 this morning. Revelation chapter 17 and I would encourage you if you are able to stand as we read this portion of scripture together. So Revelation chapter 17 starting at verse 1. It says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, and whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mysteries of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose name were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their heart to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. This is the word of God. Let's take a few moments and just greet the family. If you would like to go around, you can. If you see someone that doesn't want their hand shaken, they will stick out their elbow. So welcome. Yeah, 
<laughs> I'm biting my tongue, Barb. No, I'm not kidding. God bless you. <laughs> Always fun. Oh, dear. Wow. Prayer of Thanksgiving. That should be our hearts, right? Look what we've got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, a heart of thanksgiving. Look what you have given to us. Father, we do pray that we have been good stewards of your word and the blessings that you have bestowed upon each one of us. Each one of us will be accountable. And dear Lord, we thank you for the grace and mercy that you've also bestowed upon us. Thankful once again. So dear Lord, as we look at the functions going on within Salem Baptist Church, we thank you for your grace and mercy to us, for blessing us with uh, finances, but most importantly, blessing us with spiritual discernment and understanding and desire to have your word even more. Father God, truly, 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 we have so much to be thankful for. And everything that we have, even in that day when we receive the crowns of rewards which you will bestow upon us, we will cast them back at your feet in thanks and adoration to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So once again, as we sit here reflectively, thank you, Father, as we regard each thankful prayer of our own that you have blessed us with. <clears throat> and uh, we'll go forward praising you for all that you are and who you are in our lives so that the world, we know, world will know that we believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 404, Faith of Our Fathers. Please rise as we sing this one together. Well, good morning. I think I already said that, but good morning again. <laughs> it's good to have you all with us this morning. And for those that might not have heard, happy Father's Day. And we're looking at, if you look in your bulletins, um, punctuation makes all the difference, doesn't it? We're looking at the perfect father, Paul Bedford, it says. 
Um, there should be like a dash that Pastor Paul Bedford means like I'm the speaker for today, <laughs> right? But if you want to call me the perfect father, that's great too. Um, my kids might differ with you. And uh, my father-in-law said that the title should be changed to the perfect father and have his name put in there. And uh, Betty Lynn is the proof of that. So he says, so it's good to have you all here. Aren't you thankful for your fathers? I am thankful for all the fathers and father figures that uh, have been in my life over the years. Um, I'm thankful for my father, of course, and uh, he was a godly example and still is a godly example uh, to all of our family over the years. And especially this last year, um, he is still given us the example of a, a man of God in, in suffering and in trials and stuff like that. Um, so I thank God for my father. Uh, my father-in-law, I thank God for him. He is another man who is an example of, of godliness, an example of patience at times, and uh, an example of love and encouragement to all of his family and those of us who have become part of his family over the years. Um, so I am thankful for him as well. Um, there's a gentleman back in Sydney who is almost like my second father, uh, Jean Levesque. And uh, I think I spent more time at his house than I did at my own house when I was growing up. Uh, my best friend Jake, um, we would be over there all the time, and his father was the Cub Scout leader, so I became a Cub Scout and went everywhere with them and planted trees and all that sort of stuff. Um, this is a man that, um, that has really impacted my life over the years, and when we go to Cape Breton, we still go in and visit him and uh, his wife. His wife passed away um, last year, um, so we're hoping to get back this summer and go visit him. So, um, so these are just some men that have impacted me over the years, and we could probably take time and share stories from everybody. Uh, you know how this dad or someone else's dad has has impacted your life in a way, and I could go on and on. Um, you know, I'm thankful for biological fathers, but also for foster fathers and adoptive fathers. Um, one man and woman from the first church we pastored, um, Paul Foote Sr., um, he raised, they raised their family, their kids were adults, they had their grandkids and everything else, but they still had this heart for, for children that needed parents. So they became foster parents. And over the years, they took in three girls, um, different ages, and they just fell in love with them and then adopted them, right? So they chose these kids in their 60s and 70s, not the kids, they were the 60s and 70s, and they're starting all over, more or less. Um, there was a little girl that they adopted, a newborn. <laughs> Can you imagine? In your 60s, they became a foster parent of this little girl because her mom had issues and stuff, and they fell in love with her and adopted her, and she just celebrated, I think it was her 16th birthday, right? And uh, it's just amazing that they just opened their hearts and opened their homes. Uh, some of you have met them. Um, shortly after we moved here, um, they came during an evening service. Um, Paul and Sandy Foote, he had a big old white beard and, and everything else, but that was four years ago. Uh, nobody remembers that, right? So just thankful people like that. And, and then Timothy, you know, uh, Timothy um, just thrills my heart as he's a stepdad, and we hate that word step, right? Um, because he's a dad, and uh, he just loves Hunter to death, and there are a ton of stepdads out there that do the same thing. And again, these guys are special because they chose to be part of these children's lives, right? So it's just amazing. And I thank God for Timothy's choice and God leading him and Jamie together. And, you know, we love Hunter to death and everything else. And I could preach about Hunter for the next half hour, <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to. But we got lots of fathers that are like that, that chose the kids that they have. 
So this morning, we're going to look at the perfect father, and it's not me. We're going to look at God, the father, and the examples that we can take from him. Um, but we're going to have a little bit of fun today, too. I've got some stories mixed in here that might give you a little smile. And the first one is this. You, said the doctor to his patients, you are in terrible shape. And unless something is done quickly, you're going to die. That's good news to get from your doctor, isn't it? You're under too much stress, and you're not eating right. Tell your wife that she must start cooking more nutritious meals, and to help reduce the stress, have her keep the kids off your back so you can relax. Then make a budget and tell her she has to stick to it. If she'll do all this, you should recover completely. Otherwise, you'll be dead in a month. Obviously shaken, the patient said, Doc, would you call my wife before I get home and give her those instructions? When he got home, his wife rushed to him. I just talked to the doctor, she wailed. Honey, he said you only have 30 days to live. <laughs> so, so again, happy Father's Day to all you dads that are out there. Um, we're going to have some fun, as I said, as we look at Father's Day, but we're also going to look at some truths from God's Word, because that's why we're here. Um, one little boy, when asked to explain Father's Day, said, it's just, like, it's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the present. <laughs> and that's true, isn't it? It's just like Mother's Day, just that you don't spend as much on the present. Maybe we're not so quite, we're not quite as sentimental about Father's Day as we are for Mother's Day. Um, after all, most fathers aren't as sensitive to children's needs as mothers are. Isn't that true? Right? Mothers are sensitive and we love our mothers. You must have heard about the mother who left her room in the maternity ward to go to the nursery and she found her husband staring at, her, at his newborn baby. The mother could tell he was captivated by the baby, by how intently he stood there looking down at it. She was so touched that finally she tiptoed up behind him, slipped her arm through his and said, Honey, what are you thinking? He said, I just can't understand how they were able to make a crib like that for only $89.95. <laughs> Do you know when the first Father's Day was celebrated? 98 years ago today. 98 years ago. The first national celebration was June 19th, 1924. And I think the only one that was here back then would be John. <laughs> But June 19, 1924, by proclamation of President Calvin Coolidge. But it was all because of one lady. Her name was Sonora Smart Dodd. Back in 1909, she was sitting in church during Mother's Day, and she was listening to the Mother's Day message. And she thought to herself, why aren't fathers celebrated? She was thinking of her own father because her mother died, so her father raised her. And she was thinking how special he was for all of the, the, the parental sacrifices that he gave for his courage, his selflessness, and his love. So through her efforts, the president designated the third Sunday of June as Father's Day, and it has been celebrated every third Sunday of June since. 
for 98 years. Father's Day gives us a chance to honor those who stand at the helm and lead their families through life's battles. Right? That's what fathers do. They stand at the helm and they lead their families through life's battles. I think we all probably heard of James Dobson, Dr. Dobson. He wrote a book called Dare to Discipline. And he suggests three specific things for a father to keep in mind. And the first was the earliest years, time with mom. He said, years bring change, and often fathers become the example in attitude and action that their children follow when it comes to God, church, and spiritual things. Fathers are followed. This is not something that we can just turn over to anyone. I once read an article and it was saying, how children really don't follow our advice as fathers. Most of the time they follow our example. So if our advice is, and you see this happening all the time, and sitcoms today make fun of this all the time, you have, you know, the father with the beer in his hand and the cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and he's telling his kids, if I ever, use, ever see you drink or smoke, that'll be the end of you, right? And quite often, they don't follow the father's advice. They follow the father's actions. So men, we need to be very careful. Yes, give wise, sound, biblical advice but be careful how we live because our children are going to follow our example. Um, grandparents, our grandchildren are going to follow the examples that are given to them. So we need to be careful. Secondly, he says, the second thing he suggests is that the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. That's true, isn't it? The best thing that we can do for our children is to love their mom. And we're commanded in the scriptures to do that, are we not? Do you think back to the book of Ephesians? Paul tells the Ephesian husbands, and therefore us, to love our wives. Ephesians chapter 5.25, he tells us to love our wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands, we are to love our wives. And that's the best example that we can give to our children, that they see that dad loves mom. And James Dobson says, thirdly, a Christian father will arrange to spend time with his children. Spend time with his children. And sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? Because dads, you know, they work, and even today moms work and stuff. But dad seems to be out of the house more than mom. But we need to make time to be with our children. Even when they're grown up. I believe we should still make time for our children. And I believe every father here, if your kids called you at midnight and said, hey, I need you, we would be there for them. I know if Tim or Jamie called us at midnight some night, we would be in Moncton within a half hour, right? We need to make time for our children. Now that we're older, we need to make time for our grandchildren as well. Because sometimes nanny and papa are the only spiritual influence that children have today. So we need to make time for them. And James Dobson finishes by saying, 
Good fathers are not made, or good fathers are made, not born. Right? So we're not necessarily born a good father. You know, it takes experience, examples, and the such. But to be a good father, we need a role model. Don't we? We need a role model. An example of father that we can pattern our lives after. Where do we find such a father? Where can we look for such an example? Is there such a thing as a perfect father? Is there such a thing as a perfect father? And the answer to that is yes, there is. And today, over the next little bit that we have, we will learn of the perfect father. And of course, the perfect father is God, our perfect heavenly father. Whether we have a good relationship with our earthly father or not, whether we have good relations or not. That's not the point today. Because I know some people didn't have a good relationship with their dad. And I know some had great relationships with their dad. That's not the point, because we can always have a great relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is not like our earthly fathers. He's not like me as a father, praise the Lord. Because I'm not a perfect father. Perfect husband, yes. Perfect father, no. None of us are perfect. So I want to spend the time that we have this morning to look at God and the examples that he sets for us earthly fathers. So God is our Heavenly Father, and I trust everyone here this morning knows him personally as their Heavenly Father. So what example does he give? When we think about fathers, maybe yours not was, wasn't a, such a good example, but again, let me get this across. We can't compare our earthly fathers to God, our heavenly father. He's not like a father. He is the father. He is the father. So if you want to know what a true father looks like, don't look at me or don't look at any other man. Don't look at anyone else but God the father. Don't look at anybody but God the Father. So what are some of the characteristics that he left for us to follow? Number one, if you're a note taker, God loves his children. Isn't that a good example for us as parents? Love your kids. God loves his children. Let's go to 1 John Chapter 4, verse 19. We know pretty well all these verses, probably off by heart, but I want to look them up in case there's someone who doesn't know them or someone who's listening who's never heard these before. But it says this in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because we were so great. No, we love him because he first loved us us. Isn't that a wonderful verse? We love him because he first loved us. Well, pastor, how do you know that he loves us? Romans 5 verse 8 tells us. It proves that he loves us. Romans 5 verse 8 says this. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
God loves his children. God commendeth his love toward us. Why we were still sinners. And you go down a little bit, a few more verses, it tells us that we were enemies. So while we were enemies, he still loved us and sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die in our place. So we love him because he first loved us. And we know that he loved us because he proved that, because he sent his son to die in your stead and mine. He loved us, and he loved us first. He didn't wait for you and I to meet his expectations. He didn't wait for us to make him proud. Did he? He didn't say, okay, Mr. Bedford, clean up your act, and then I'll love you. He didn't say, okay, Mr. Bedford, here's the standard, and once you hit it, you got my love. We didn't have to do any of that. He didn't wait until we measured up to the standard. He loved us first. He loved us completely. He loved us constantly. And he loves us unconditionally. Do you know what that's called? Francis Chan calls God's love crazy. Crazy love. And it's true, isn't it? His love is a crazy love for us. Unconditional love. Complete, consistent love. And he loved you and me before we loved him. That's amazing. So the example we get out of this is God loves his children. It may upset him when we disobey. It may sadden him when we go astray. But guess what, folks? He never stops Loving. Never. Let's flip over a couple of pages if you're still in Romans and go to chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other creature, including myself, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will separate us from his love. That's how much he loves each and every one of us. So what a great example for us earthly fathers. Dad, Love your children. Well, pastor, if you knew what it was like when I raised my children, friend, doesn't matter. June 19, 2022. 1150. Start loving your children today. Put the past aside. Love your children. That's the example we get from God. He loves us. Emma Bombeck, she wrote something that was, I thought it was rather intriguing. Listen to what she wrote. When the Lord was creating fathers, Mother's Day we hear, when God created mothers, he gave them a big heart and a big smile and all that sort of stuff. But well, what did he do when he created fathers? Listen to this. He started with a tall frame. They must have ran out of tall frames when he created me. But he started with a tall frame. And an angel standing nearby said, what kind of father is that? If they're going to, to make children so close to the ground, why have you put a father up so high? He won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling. He won't be able to tuck a child in without bending. He won't be able to kiss a child without stooping. God smiled and said, yes, 
But if I make him child size, who will the children have to look up to? And when God made the father's hands, they were large. The angel shook his head and said, I don't think you want to make hands like that. Large hands are clumsy. They can't manage diaper pins, small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even remove splinters caused by baseball bats. God smiled again and said, I know, but they're large enough to hold everything a small boy empties from his pockets at the end of the day, yet small enough to cup a child's face into his hands. Then God molded long, slim legs and broad shoulders. The angel nearly had a heart attack. Boy, this is the end of the week, all right. How is he going to pull a child close to him without the child falling between his legs? God smiled and said, a mother needs a lap, but a father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled, balance a boy on a bicycle, or hold a sleepy head on the way home from the circus. God was in the middle of creating two of the largest feet anyone has ever seen when the angel could not contain himself any longer. That's not fair, he said. Do you honestly think that those large boats are going to get out of bed early in the morning when those babies cry? Or walk through a small birthday party without crushing at least three of the guests? Again, God smiled and said, They'll work, you'll see. They'll scare off mice at the summer cabin or leave footprints that will be a challenge to follow. God worked throughout the night, giving the father few words, but a firm voice and eyes that saw everything. Finally, almost an afterthought, he added tears. Then he turned to the angel and said, Now are you satisfied that he can love as much as a mother? And the angel was silent. Yes, God does love his children. And so should we. So dad, love your children. Second example we get from, from the perfect father is God encourages his children, doesn't he? God encourages his children. God is quick to encourage us. A psychologist tells about going to a school as a little boy and failing a test in math. So the teacher wrote a note and sent it home with him. It said, your son just can't handle math. Well, his dad sat him down and told him, Son, I guess you just don't have an aptitude for math. So from then on, he flunked every test in math. He said, I could never do anything in math. Then one day, the teacher put a problem on the board and asked the class to solve it. But nobody could figure out the answer. I looked at the problem and suddenly realized that I knew the answer, so I held up my hand, and everybody laughed because they knew I couldn't solve it. But I walked to the blackboard, worked the problem, came back with the right answer. Then I realized that it wasn't my lack of aptitude at all. It was just that everyone told me that I couldn't do math, and because I believed it, I didn't even try. So dads, we need to encourage our children. Encourage them. We need to praise and compliment our children. The world, the school system, and everything else, it does enough of bringing our kids down. They don't need it at home. So encourage your children. Didn't God encourage Moses at the burning bush when he told him that he was going to deliver Israel? God encouraged him. 
He encouraged Joshua as Joshua set out to conquer the promised land. He encouraged him with words. He encouraged him with his presence. And he encouraged him with assistance. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. The sixth book in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. It says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That's encouragement, isn't it? Hey, I'm going to be with you wherever you go. Be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed or saddened because I am with you every step of the way. He said that to Joshua. And guess what? It applies to us today. He is with you every step of the way to encourage you with his words, with his presence, and with his assistance. God saw the things that children could do. And he encouraged them to go out and do them. He encouraged them. Sadly, many parents today, as I said, are prone to send messages laced with criticism instead of encouragement. Encourage your children. It's so important to watch our words, is it not? It's really important. And the Apostle Paul challenged us in that. In Ephesians 4.29, he says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but let words of encouragement, words that will build up your children and not tear them down. That's the words we need to use, and we need to use those same words with everybody. Words that will build them up and encourage them that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So God loves his children. We can do that? Yes. God encourages his children. We can do that? Let's look at one more. This is one today that the world doesn't like. God disciplines his children. He disciplines his children. Recently, I read a story about triplets. I could never imagine having triplets. Three young boys who got along well. They saw everything alike. They were loyal to each other. If one got into trouble, they wouldn't tattle on each other. A neighbor asked the father, how in the world do you know which one to punish if there's trouble? He said, oh, that's easy. I send all three to bed without supper, and the next morning, I spank the one with a black eye. <laughs> God disciplines his children. God is good, and he's a loving father. Yet, he disciplines his children. He does not discipline us in spite of his goodness. He disciplines us because of his goodness. He does not discipline in spite of love. He disciplines because he loves. And we discipline our children because we love them. We love them. Do you know what happens when a child receives no discipline? When they grow up, they show no respect to anyone. They show no respect to authority. And if someone tries to put them in their place, it's like it's the end of the world. Parents, it's our job to discipline our children. Now, I'm not saying it's our job to abuse our children. 
but it's our job to discipline them. Straighten them out. Don't tell anybody. But I spanked our kids when they grew up. Today, you're risking jail. And believe it or not, I spanked Timothy more than Brittany. Timothy was a son of a gun. I would be working, and Betty Lynn would spank him, and he's like, ah, ha, ha, until she said, wait till your dad gets home. Then the tune changed. But our kids turned out all right. Our kids respect authority. God disciplines his children. We need to discipline ours as well. I don't tell many stories of Brittany, so I can share one. She may be listening today. I remember the first time I took her to the mall. First time she was in a mall with me, and she was probably two. So we're going down the aisles, and she's like, I want that, I want that, I want that. I'm like, no. So she started bawling and yelling and screaming. People must have thought that I was killing her. But all I said was no. And I said, if you keep that up, you're going to have something to cry about. Never thought I'd say those words because my parents always said it to us. And I'm like, I don't understand why they're saying that. But they came out of my mouth that day. And she kept on. So I took her down a side aisle and I gave her a little spanking. And she's never done that again. I don't know if I ever took her to the mall again, but she's never done that again. <laughs> But we need to discipline our children, not because we get a thrill out of whacking them or doing whatever. It's because we love them. We love them. If our children were going to put their hand on the stove and we tell them, don't do that, why do we do that? Because we love them and we don't want them to get hurt. And then they go the second, don't do that. And then they don't listen to you, and they put their hand on it. We told you, don't do that, because we knew what the consequences were. Folks, we need to discipline our children. Deuteronomy 5, or 8, 5 says, Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, or disciplines his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And Proverbs 3.12 says, For when or whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So God is good. He's a loving father that disciplines his children when they need it. The faithful or the father who disciplines his children wisely is reflecting the character of God. We discipline wisely. Hebrews chapter 12, and we will eventually get there. Most of that chapter is talking about the discipline of God. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 and 11 says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. How many have ever said when you were disciplining your children, this is going to hurt me, then it's going to hurt you? And usually that's true. We don't want to discipline our children. But as a loving parent, we have to. Because we love them and want them to go the way that God wants them to go. Because it says here, nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So God loves us, he encourages us, and he disciplines us. So what is our responsibility? It's our responsibility 
to bring our children up, our grandchildren up, in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's our responsibility, is to bring our children up in the things of the Lord. Our teaching should begin when they're young, right? But sometimes that didn't happen. So we can today start sharing God with our children if we haven't in the past. As long as they have breath, it's not too late. So we can start telling and instructing our children, even if they're adults, in the things of the Lord. And as grandparents, we need to instruct our grandchildren in the things of the Lord. That's very important. Psalm 78, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and so many other Bible passages tell us that we need to be teaching our children when we're sitting down, when we're standing up, when we walk, when we lie down, when we, what we need to do is pass it on from one generation to the next. I praise God that I'm a third generation Christian. My grandfather was saved, my dad is saved, and I'm saved. And Timothy's a fourth generation Christian. And we want to see his kids and Brittany's kids know the Lord. So as parents and grandparents, we need to instruct them as they go along their day. We can do that in a right way, or we can do that in a wrong way. We can create misconceptions about God, can't we? And people do. Let me finish with a little parable about three fathers who each felt the soft hand of his child in theirs, and they realized their responsibility of teaching their children about God. The first father, he felt the awesome responsibility that was his. So he taught his child about the power and might of God. As they walked down the pathway of life and came to tall trees in the forest, this father would point to them and he said, God made them and he can cause them to come crushing down any time that he wants to. And as they walked a little further, he seen the sun, the hot sun, and he said, this is God's sun. He made it, and he can cause it to be so hot and so intense that the plants in the field will wither and die. So he was teaching his children about the power and might of God. Again and again, he hammered home the power of God and how his child must be obedient to God. Then one day they came face to face with God. And the child hid behind his father, afraid even to look, refusing to put his hand into the hand of God. His father only talked about the power and might of God and how God could crush anything anytime he wanted he became very afraid of God. The second father also realized his responsibility to teach his child about God. Hurriedly, he tried to teach all the important lessons he knew. As they looked at the trees, they only stopped for a moment to gaze at them. As they looked at the flowers of the field, they hurried on by. He told stories, but they were hurried and crammed together. He filled the child full of facts, but he never taught him how to live or to love God. Finally, one day, at twilight, they came face to face with God. But the child only gave God a casual glance, and then he turned away. The third father felt the touch of the tender hand in his, adjusted his steps to the tiny steps of the child. They walked along stopping to look at all of God's beauty and grandeur. They walked in the fields and picked the flowers. They felt the delicate petals and smelt their fragrance. They watched a bird in flight 
and another building her nest and laying her eggs and sitting on them until they hatched. They watched all the beauties of nature while the father told his child stories about God over and over again. Finally, one day in the twilight, they saw the face of God. And without hesitation, the child placed his hand trustingly in the hand of his heavenly father. So we need to be careful how we instruct our children in the things of God. God loves his children. He encourages his children. He disciplines his children. It is up to us as fathers on this Father's Day to follow the examples of our perfect father. And folks, it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start. Father, we thank you that you are the perfect father. And you have given us many examples that we need to follow as earthly fathers. We thank you today that you are a God who loves us. And you prove that love by sending your only begotten son into this world to live here, to die here, to pay the penalty for our sin. And you tell us whoever will trust or believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. I pray today if there's anyone here listening who has not put their faith and trust in you, that today they realize that God loves them, that you love them before they would even think of loving you, and that they would cry out today for this wonderful gift of salvation. Father, we thank you that you are a God who encourages us. I don't know where we would be without the encouragement that you give us. Help us to do that to others, to encourage others, to build each other up and not tear each other down with our comments and criticisms. And thank you for disciplining us when we need it. Lord, we know that we are your children when you discipline us. And we thank you for that. And help us as fathers, as mothers, to discipline our children when need be. Because they need it. And we do it because we love them. So, Father, our responsibility, as we just looked at, is to instruct our children in the things of God and tell them all about you. Help us to do that even if it means we start doing that today as our children are older. It's not too late. So we thank you for speaking to us today. We give you the honor, the glory, and praise for who you are. And again, we thank you for each dad that is represented here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We have one more hymn to sing. It's uh, 574, A Child of the King. I stand with that.
Thank you.